So we will go to the next speaker, Professor Lydia Moravska, who is a distinguished professor in the School of Earth and Atmospheric Sciences at the Queensland University of Technology. And she has been named one of the 100 most influential people in the world by Time magazine in 2021 for recognizing the importance of aerosol transmission. She will be speaking about airborne infection transmission and impact on front frontline workers. Over to you, Professor Moravska. Thank you so much in advance. Well, the video is way uh, loading. I'll just say hello. I pre-recorded the video because I'm at the moment on holiday in uh, um, Portugal, and I wasn't sure about the quality of the connection here. So that's why it is recorded, but I'm here. Good morning, colleagues, and many thanks for inviting me to share with you what I know about particle generation from human respiratory activities and its impacts. It was in 2003, during uh, the epidemic of SARS-1, when I started working on this topic. And since then, with uh, my research team and colleagues from around the world, We've done a lot of research on many different aspects of particle generation and uh, what happens to them. So when this pandemic started, we have a very good insight uh, into the role of airborne transmission of respiratory infections in general and the specific uh, virus as well. This route of transmission was not recognized at the time by the WHO. I must say that the, it was the impact of the transmission of healthcare workers in Italy, which was at the time uh, the epicenter of the pandemic, was something which motivated me to act and to convince the WHO that this is important, this is significant, and it has to be taken into account in order to lower the risk of infection. I, with this, I uh, structured my presentation uh, around a few points. Generation of particles during respiratory activities, detection of the particles, particle characteristics and what happens to them in the air, and finally, mitigation. But I will start with definitions. Is it aerosol or droplet? In aerosol science, where I belong, aerosol is defined as an assembly of liquid or solid particles suspended in a gaseous medium long enough to enable observation and measurement. Droplet is a liquid particle, which means it's a subset of particles, but it doesn't have anything to do with particle size. In medical sciences, however, as uh, most of you know very well, aerosol are smaller particles, droplet larger particles with the division uh, at five micrometers. But I'd say let's don't worry about these differences. I will call them particles, which is correct from both disciplines, and this way we'll avoid uh, any problems with definitions. So how these particles are generated? Um, Particle aerosolization and respiratory activities result from the passage of an air stream at a sufficiently high speed over the surface of a liquid. Where is this surface of the liquid and the stream? In our respiratory tract, and in fact, many different passages in the respiratory tract. I often compare what happens there to what happens in this old fashioned perfume bottle or a nebulizer where particles are generated, nebulizers, uh, which um, many of us are used quite frequently. The point, however, is that it is more complex what happens in the respiratory tract compared with one nebulizer. So generation of particles in respiratory tract, if we start from the lower part of the respiratory tract, from the bronchial <coughs> region, um, what happens there, it's <coughs> excuse me, fluid blockages which form there during exhalation, and then they burst during subsequent inhalation producing particles. Somewhat different processes occur in larynx, and here we have vocal fold vibrations um, leading to particle formation, and yet again different process in um, 
in the mouse. And here you in speech articulation, the um, particles are formed from saliva. If there's there are viruses or bacteria in the respiratory tract, they are aerosolized with these particles as well. This is a, a, a cross section um, in a large way what happens in the bronchiolite region. So if we start from the uh, from the top flow goes uh, into the right, uh, and then gradually the bronchioli is more and more constrained and eventually blocked. Flow direction changes and eventually the particles burst. Now, the point is that we cannot measure this process directly, but just model and simulate them. We cannot send any probe into the respiratory tract. Well, maybe in the future there will be some nanobots which we will be available for this but not yet. So we can study the particles and detect them after they are emitted. How do we do this? There are several different ways of doing this, but there's usually some complexity involved in this. This is our first flow tunnel, which we built to study particles from respiratory activities. And what you can see here is um, this person emitting and particles flowing down with the stream of air straightened and uh, filtered. And we measure the particles with a number of different instruments uh, uh, which are uh, located down the stream. So the particles, uh, the biggest particles, the, uh, the position, as well as particles in the smaller size ranges. So this is one way of doing this, and this way, this way we know exactly the age of these particles uh, as they were emitted. But there are other objectives to the study which uh, can, uh, which maybe which cannot be achieved with that setup. And for example, um, for those other objectives, we build this a rotator, and here particles are accumulating over uh, the time which um, we uh, consider necessary for the objectives of the study to achieve higher concentration of the particles, but also to test how long pathogens stay viable or infectious. But in this rotating drum, um, we cannot um, uh, investigate fast changing processes, the flow tunnel is a better way for this. So with that te uh, that te these techniques and many, many other different techniques, uh, we collectively, scientists, were able to develop a reasonably good understanding and of particle characteristics and they fade in the air. This is an example of particle size distribution from speaking and breathing with particle diameter in logar uh, logarithmic axis on the um, uh, x-axis and on the vertical axis particle concentration. We can see that um, the, the distribution is quite wide, but the majority of the particles are smaller. Smaller, majority of them are smaller than 10 micrometers, because as you can see, the uh, scale is logarithmic. So while there are particles in the smaller size range, but significantly fewer of them. Smaller particles stay suspended in the air longer. We can also see that uh, this size distribution has a structure, structure such that we have this smaller mode, which we call bronchiolite fluid uh, film burst mode. And um, it is, uh, it's been pointed out that um, these particles are also the source of H5N1 virus because that's where it's located in the respiratory tract. The bigger mode, laryngeal vibration mode, and the mode of the largest particles, oral speech articulation movement. And here, this has been suggested as the source of H1 and 1. Now, this is a nice and smooth size distribution, but it required 10 data processing steps of data from several different uh, instruments to put on this diagram. Please also note that we are talking about particle number concentration, counting individual particles. What are the concentration and emission rates um, during different respiratory activities? Here we've got from the same um, experimental setup, we've got activity, 
And we are talking about breathing, nose, mouth, counting, voice, whisper, and concentration on the vertical axis. We can see that all the activities result in particle uh, generation, but vocalization, the highest that vocalization here was a uh, sound. During this pandemic, um, there was more experiments of this type, um, type conducted. And here the investigators look um, at the uh, role of um, loudness. So we've got different activities on the horizontal axis and the loudness and normal, normalized particle mass concentration on vertical. I just wanted to, uh, to um, point out to um, this, the loudest, so here it's singing happy birthday as loud as uh, possible. And here, this one is just breathing. So you can see how significantly more particles are emitting during these loud activities, significantly because this is um, a logarithmic axis. So we are talking about 10, one, uh, 10 to 100 times more. What happens to these particles in the air once they are emitted? Um, there have been uh, many discussions about those particles falling, but in fact, most of the particles do what this particle does on the screen. They are floating. As it was already assessed and calculated by Wells in the 1930s, Wells, the father of this area. And here we've got particle diameter and falling in quotation mark time from a height of one meter. If we look what happens to the particles, which are uh, in, my, uh, in the majority, the falling time, which is, is, is 300 seconds or 30,000 seconds for one um, 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 micrometer particle, which means the particles are floating in the air. This is graphically presented uh, here where we have a virtual origin uh, in the respiratory tract, uh, emission from the nose of mouth, and then we've got the cloud uh, moving upwards with a few larger particles dropping, but most of them staying. And this is the whole field of flow dynamics in the air. So to summarize the state of knowledge of um, particles from respiratory activities, the majority are smaller than one micrometer and the vast majority are smaller than 10 micrometers. Such small particles are light and stay, can stay suspended in the air for a long time. How long time? Minutes, hours in an indoor environment and travel long distances. How long distances? Meters or tens of meters in indoor environment. And all respiratory activities, including breathing, generate the particles by the vocalization, uh, the most of them. Where's the virus in these particles? Um, this virus, um, SARS uh, COVID 2 naked virus, is of the size of about 0.12 micrometers, which means that the particles carrying the virus are bigger than this because in addition to the virus, they also contain water from uh, our respiratory tract, mucus, cells, and so on. It's been uh, shown that particles which are smaller than one micrometer contain higher loads of SARS-CoV-2. Um, higher loads as a body of the particles, not necessarily an individual particles, but these particles are in the majority. So majority of the particles within uh, the mid submicrometer range and slightly larger. This is presented um, at this study quoted in the previous slide that the study was already uh, published, conducted in mixed uh, COVID rooms, hospital rooms, showing particle size distribution and diameter on the horizontal axis and concentration on the vertical axis. The same instrument as in our studies was used to measure part uh, particle concentration, but um, the researchers also collected um, samples for particle analysis. So what they've measured is everything, uh, particles from respiratory activities and the background. Also quite complex uh, data analysis was required for this with several processing steps. Uh, what I'd like to point out that here, the scale, again, 
Now, you may say that why it is so different to the previous diagram, because this moat is so much bigger. Yes, but here we've got mass concentration and mass of a few larger particles dominate mass of smaller particles in the previous diagram were particle number. But the main point of this is that what they found was that the highest load of the of this virus was in the smallest size range of one micrometer in this hospital room. So the state of knowledge of virus laden particles, um, where they are overall smaller particles contain higher loads of SARS-CoV-2, they are from the deeper respiratory tract, larger particles, less virus as they originate from the mouth and therefore breathing speaking is the main source of these particles. Airborne transmission, therefore, is inhalation of virus-laden particles from the space anywhere in the space. A infected person on the left and susceptible people at um, different distances. So airborne transmission is inhalation of particles anywhere in the room, as well as in inhalation of the particles emitted by the infected person in the close proximity. Of course, in the close proximity, the concentration of the particles of all sizes is larger and the dynamics of the process is larger as well. But it's inhalation anywhere in the space. So since the particles are in the air, we need to do something to, to mitigate them, to lower the risk of airborne infection. During the pandemic, we've heard many times, particularly uh, after the airborne transmission was recognized as an important factor, um, uh, open the window. This is the main recommendation here in this uh, WHO uh, uh, poster. At the end of last year, good ventilation protects you from COVID-19 infection. And as you can see, each panel contains a window, which is the message, open the window. Open the window means we are talking about natural ventilation, otherwise airing. What is it? And where is it? In homes, schools, restaurants, shops, very commonly, but also in many different healthcare facilities, this is the main mode of ventilation. Now, when it's not too cold, not too hot, not too noisy, the window or windows are open and potentially there is good ventilation. But in reality, in most climate, most of the time, there are some problems. Too cold, too hot, too noisy, um, too polluted, too unsafe. So the windows are closed and there's no ventilation, which means we can often put an equation mark, natural ventilation, no ventilation. I always put a little disclaimer. When I mean no ventilation, I really mean minimal ventilation because there's always some leakage uh, of the air through the building envelope, but often not much of it. So let's talk now about building engineering controls to lower infection risk. And here we have a number of options starting with um, sufficient and effective ventilation, I'll say a few words about this, and particle filtration and air disinfection. What is sufficient ventilation in relation to infection transmission? Um, can we use the existing ventilation guidelines or standards for controlling infection transmission? After all, there are um, documents like this. Unfortunately, it is more complicated because to answer that question, we need to use risk assessment models and tools. They are developed based on Wells-Riley equation from the 1930s uh, and a little bit later using infectious quanta. What is a quantum? It is the dose of infectious airborne particles required to cause infection in 63% of susceptible person, per, per persons distribution. During the pandemic, these models and tools based on this equation um, basically mushroomed and got much more sophisticated. 
Now, this is a, an example that you, we've used these models well below the pandemic. And here is to assess the ventilation, the infection risk um, in relation to, when, um, to um, uh, how much ventilation is used in the Prince Charles Hospital in Brisbane, lung function laboratory, for three, two different types, 15 and uh, 45 minutes occupancy, and for uh, three different pathogens, influenza, tuberculosis, and rhinovirus. What we can see here that uh, on the horizontal axis, outdoor air exchange per hour with the increase of this, infection risk dramatically decreases dramatically because this is again a logarithmic uh, axis and depends on the uh, duration of, of exposure and also on the, uh, on the quantum emitted, which is on the specific pathogen. Okay, uh, so, is it um, is it fine? We've got now uh, ventilation, and um, we can resolve the problem with infection risk. Unfortunately, there are limits to how far ventilation or how much ventilation can lower the transmission risk. We recently conducted studies um, on the most infectious diseases, which um, are this. For, including SARS-CoV-2, but SARS-CoV-2 was the, the wild virus, wild variant, uh, which was less infectious than measles. The current virus, Delta and Omicron, are more infectious than measles. But what we found uh, is that even at high ventilation rate of 14 liters per second, uh, it this may not be sufficient to maintain event reproduction numbers below one. Now, 14 liters per second is more than WHO uh, recommends, which is 10 liters per second. In principle, we can keep increasing ventilation, but it comes a limit to how much it is possible, feasible, or makes sense to increase ventilation. This finding is not new. In 1991, uh, there was already analysis like this conducted by Ed Nadell and colleagues and pointing out to the theoretical limits of protection achieved by building ventilation. So what, what, what can we do to control the risk of infection by such pathogens, such infectious pathogens? In addition to ventilation, we can or should disinfect the air, but in a way that no additional pollution is generated indoors. How to do it? Germicidal UV air disinfection, which has low energy requirements, does not generate new pollutants in the air, is silent and robust, low maintenance, low cost. Um, extension of this technology now to use a different wavelength, we need to so-called far UV, 222 nanometers, is even safer uh, to what was used before because it has very low penetration into human tissue. So basically, uh, we could be doing, or it could be doing to the air what we already do to water. Every drop of water we drink from the tap is disinfected. And I'd like very strongly point out that this is not a new technology. It was used already in 1930s and 1940s, where the studies from 1940s, in uh, schools uh, in, um, in the United States to combat missiles transmission. And since then, it's been used in many different settings. It is a mature technology. Now, two other points, in addition to what I was saying, um, uh, efficient ventilation, how much ventilation we have. There's also a problem with air flow distribution and direction, in addition to how much air is um, provided into the space. There have been quite a lot of studies conducted uh, on this, and in particular this one in Prince of Wales Hospital in Hong Kong during um, SARS-1. So what it is, um, uh, what the study showed uh, is that when comparing the reported attack rate distribution with predicted average infection risk distribution based on the air flow, the two agreed quite well. So first of all, the conclusion was that up to 60% of the transmission was by airborne and also linked to the flow direction. Flow direction is very important. Um, and um, this is um, 
in a different way uh, presented in the, in the study which uh, we've done here in Brisbane, but the pediatric intensive uh, care unit case study showing the unit at the location of the measurement uh, of uh, our measurement instrumentation, nurse station, and the different beds here. The conclusion from the study was that what was happening in the bed in relation to aerosol generation, in relation to cleaning, um, in terms of particle generation in one place of the unit was detected elsewhere in the unit because of the flow direction. Now, the second aspect I wanted to point out is infection risk at close proximity. Now, close proximity and what it means varies dependently how close we are to people, whether uh, it is um, on this panel in the middle here, um, intimate closeness, just immediately next to the person, personal or social, one meter or slightly more. Uh, and um, on this, uh, on the left hand side, it just shows the plume of particles uh, from one person to another. So here, what we show on this um, bottom diagram is the distance and the risk of infection uh, as a function of the distance. For speaking for 15 minutes exposure, one minute and 10 second exposure. So we can see that uh, for the longer time exposure and the closer proximity, the risk, well, it's written basically 100%. So this is that close proximity. It is before really ventilation has a chance or uh, disinfection has a chance to, to take care of the particles. So in this proximity, it is minimum time spent to lower the risk and basically respirators. So aerosolization and its impact, I've presented all what we knew and know about the mechanism, uh, which knowledge generated over the last two decades, during this pandemic, there have been many, many more studies published on this, with one of the first publications on the airborne SARS-CoV-2 transmission uh, in Wuhan, through the studies later at different states of the pandemic, and with the specific focus on hospital uh, environment, health, healthcare environment. This is just an example. There's a very large body on such studies. So in, sum, in, the, in summary, we have, there is very good quantitative evidence on characteristics of particles and virus laden particles from human respiratory activities on what happens to the particles in the air, which means transport and uh, the removal dynamics, deposition of the particles in the respiratory tract upon inhalation, inhalation airborne transmission. Well, is such evidence available for each individual outbreak? Of course not, because this is, as I've discussed, a complex process and retrospectively, we never have all the required parameters for real life scenarios for every scenario. However, there is a great deal of evidence, such studies which I've showed um, in, in the previous slide and many, many more available from outbreaks supporting airborne transmission as the main cause of infection and how to uh, mitigate this and in particular the risk in healthcare setting um, where, which is particularly high and again need for mitigating it. With this I, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Many thanks. Thank you so much Professor Morawska. We have one question in, and the question is portable CO2 monitors can be obtained over Amazon for about 150 US dollars. What is your feeling about the public screening indoor air settings using CO2 levels as an indicator of good air quality? Over to you. Thanks for the question. It is a very uh, good question, and I fully agree that uh, CO2 monitors are very good devices for um, checking indoor air quality. Uh, I carry one with me. Uh, so yes, if the concentration of CO2 are high, uh, well, this immediately gives an idea about the problem. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for your talk.